I spent a lot of time with him. We traveled around the country on his jet. I was in all of his homes with him. He and Melania and I went to Palm Beach. Uh, when the book came out, he didn't feel very good about it, and he ultimately sued me for defamation. I think it's the biggest libel lawsuit in U.S. history. He sued me for $5 billion. Describe the financial situation that Donald Trump was in in the late 90s. He had come close to personal bankruptcy. He ultimately oversaw six corporate bankruptcies. And he had become in the late 1980s and, and for most of the 1990s this punchline about the excesses of the 1980s. Trump found himself on the financial precipice. He had guaranteed personally almost $900 million in loans. He owed some of the biggest banks in the U.S about $3.6 billion, and he couldn't pay back any of it. Now, at some point, he starts looking for more money overseas. He's having trouble borrowing money here. Then how much did he need foreign cash? I, I think it's really important for people to understand how small Donald Trump's business is. The, the sort of notion that he uh, is the recipient of billions and billions of dollars of money flowing in from overseas, I think is mythic because his business is so small that it hasn't relied on billions and billions of dollars from overseas. When Donald Trump says that most of the family's assets are, are come in from Russia, I think what he's actually talking about are condominium sales. Uh, I don't think he's talking about billion dollars of bank loans. He's talking about units in these various Trump properties that change hands. And it's important to remember that Hong Kong, London, and New York, all in the real estate communities, are the center of a lot of this loose money. Some of it's dirty, undoubtedly. Some of it's being laundered, undoubtedly. Some of it's also just people overseas who are in countries where they're not sure they can safely invest their cash where they live. They put it in property in places like London and New York. So it's a very mixed bag, but it's certainly not multi-billion sure. dollar transaction. Do we know whether any of that laundered money ended up in Trump properties? Well, I think the biggest example of this, and I think it's one of the most troubling, is, is a project that used to be known as the Trump Soho, uh, a mixed-use condominium hotel in Lower Manhattan that is alleged in court papers to have been a conduit for money being laundered from Eastern Europe and through people who had organized crime backgrounds and people that Trump himself knew to have organized crime backgrounds. And I know he knew because we asked him about it in a deposition in our litigation, and he was presented with the information that one of his primary business partners had a background, uh, had gone to jail, and also was, uh, was affiliated with the mob. And, and Trump continued famously with that man. His name was Felix Sater. Tell us about where Felix Sater comes from. Who is he? Felix Sater is a career criminal born in the, in the former Soviet Union. He moves to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn with his family. Uh, he ultimately becomes a, a world-class scammer and, and uh, an assault artist. He goes to jail after sticking a broken margarita glass into the face of someone in a bar with whom he had a disagreement. Uh, he gets out of jail and he ends up in a, uh, what we would call in the United States, a boiler room operation. It's a, an investing scam that targets vulnerable or ignorant people. Federal law enforcement got onto this and caught him. And he would have gone to jail, but for the fact that Felix had a lot of interesting information that the US government wanted, primarily around um, espionage and loose stinger missiles. Uh, the interesting thing about that is how did Felix get that information and where did he get it? So he had contacts in the, in the, in the Kremlin uh, who were able to give him not only credible but actionable information about loose stinger missiles. And he was able to bring this back to the U.S. and say, I'll give you this information uh, if you give me a get out of jail free card. So that's what happened. The, 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 the federal government lets him go. Uh, he gets a deferred sentence for 10 years. I don't think Donald Trump wants to admit what he actually knows about Felix Sater, which is that Felix Sater had a mob background and, and, a, and, a, and a troubled legal history, because it then raises the question of why Donald Trump, as a business person, would get into bed with partners like that. And I think the answer to why he does is that if you've got a big enough bag of cash and you plant it on Donald Trump's desk, he'll do business with you, no questions asked.
It's interesting if President Trump says he has no relationship with Felix Sater, that Felix Sater has apparently a working business relationship with Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohn. Michael Cohn has, has functioned as something of a consigliere and a fixer for the president. Vis-a-vis -vis, um, Felix Sater, I think there's two interesting uh, transactions. One's diplomatic and one's a business transaction that Felix Sater and Michael Cohn intersect with. Uh, the first, which came to light only recently, was at the end of 2015. Uh, Felix and Cohn discussed the possibility of making overtures to the Kremlin about building a new Trump Tower in Moscow, going so far as to contact the Kremlin to see if they could do this. Felix is in that transaction. Felix is sharing emails with Michael Cohn saying, these will be big deals, we can get these done. He's clearly still part and parcel of some of the business deals and machinations inside the Trump organization eight years after Donald Trump told us in our litigation that he didn't know that, that, that until then that Felix was a career criminal. Is there any way that Donald Trump can say that he knew nothing about what Cohen and Sater were cooking up at that point or was he, can you tie him to that? Uh, at some point uh, what he knows and what he didn't, doesn't know and what he did and what he didn't do is going to be tested under oath and under a magnifying class held in the long arm of Robert Mueller. But while he was a candidate, didn't he sign a letter of intent on the Moscow project? Uh, that's correct. He did sign a letter of it. So we do know that Trump, as a candidate, signed a letter of intent on the Moscow project indicating he had knowledge there was something that was going to be done in Moscow. He had knowledge of who the people on his side of the deal were. And it could easily be construed that his effort to get a deal done in Moscow uh, shaded any policy decisions he might have later uh, considered as president, including things like lifting economic sanctions on Russia. So the Kushner companies have one particularly large property in um, New York that, in which they hold a truly eye-watering amount of debt. There's a skyscraper on Fifth Avenue, which has an interesting address, 666 Fifth Avenue. That's been a subject of mirth in the US media. The mark of the devil. Yes, yes, the omen. Um, the Kushner family, in the person of Jared Kushner, bought that building in the mid-2000s, right before the financial crisis hit. Jared wildly overpaid for the building, and he wound up with well over a billion dollars in debt that he couldn't service, and that the building itself wasn't profitable enough to help him pay down. The problem remains, however, is that Jared Kushner, since that time, has had this debt looming over his head. In late 2016, in December of 2016, after his father-in-law has won the election, but before he's inaugurated as president, uh, Jared takes meetings with Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador to the United States. Uh, it's unknown exactly what they've talked about. Different elements of, of that have come out in the press. Jared allegedly wanted to create a diplomatic back channel to Syria. Out of some of those meetings, at, la at least, the Russian ambassador to the United States decides that he'll introduce Jared to a prominent Russian banker, uh, an individual named Sergei Gorkov, who has close ties to the Kremlin. He was trained in the same uh, intelligence services, in part, uh, as, as Vladimir Putin. So the ambassador introduces him to uh, Sergei Gorkov, who is the CEO of Vinesh Ekonom Bank, or VE Bank, VEB Bank. VEB is a sanctioned bank. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's laboring under the, this heavy hand of United States sanctions that, don't, that do not help its business along. Uh, he also is a very influential financier in Russia. He has close ties to the Kremlin, and he had been trained for part in, partially as a, uh, in the intelligence uh, academies in Russia. The fact pattern here is interesting. Jared Kushner, who needs a loan, uh, is also taking meetings with the Russian ambassador to the United States, who decides it's a good idea to introduce Jared to a prominent Russian banker. Well, why? Um, is there any precedent for this where you've got the two of the, you know, the president and then p one of the second most important people in the White House having these ongoing businesses which are not in blind trusts that carry these enormous vulnerabilities with them. Is there any precedent for this situation? 
No, we're at an unprecedented moment in the White House because the Trump family and the Kushner family have not taken the necessary steps to fully divest themselves from their business interests and make sure that those business interests don't either overlap or directly intersect with the policies they're pursuing in the White House. We've never had anything like this in the United States. Do you still find Donald Trump funny? No, because the stakes are too high.